Greetings and welcome to Chapter 5, Section 3, The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. I'm going to use these slides that were provided for Stewart's Calculus Early Transcendentals 8th edition. 8th edition? Why can't I say edition? Edition. I'll try to clear that up as we go along. Uh, so the Fundamental Theorem, there aren't a ton of slides here. We're not going to do a ton of arithmetic. The idea, the topic conceptually of the fundamental theorem of calculus is very important, as you might imagine. It's fundamental. So let's talk about it, and in talking about it, we're going to be giving the precise inverse relationship between the derivative and the integral. They are indeed inverses of each other, just as squaring and square rooting are inverses of each other. So when we look at the fundamental theorem of calculus, one thing that we're seeing here that's very familiar to us now is this integral symbol, which looks like a vertically elongated S. Thank you, Leibniz. Our limits of integration here are going from lowercase a up to x. a is a constant, as you might imagine, and as you might infer from seeing that we're going to be working on this interval here from a to b. x is going to be a variable and it says that it's going to vary between a and b. All right, so you can read the rest of this slide. That's all I want to focus on from that slide at the moment. I like this slide because of this phrase or sentence right here that we can think of g, which is from the previous slide, uh, as the area so far function. On the previous slide, we saw that we were integrating from a to x, where our x value can vary on the interval from a to b. So in this uh, graphical depiction we're seeing here, x is a little bit more than 50% of the way through the interval, and integrating is helping us to find the area under the curve. So we could do the integration, and we would end up with a function that still has the variable x in it. And then once we determined where on the interval we want it to be, we could drop in that x value and we would have a formula that would give us the area under the curve from a to x. This is an example problem to help us get the idea of what's going on there and what we mean by sliding that x value forward on the interval from a to b. So here's our function y equals f of t. So y is a function of, of t. Our horizontal axis is labeled t, vertical is y, great. And we're going to be doing some integration. g of x equals this integral. We're starting, um, our lower limit of integration is zero. So our graph is starting here at what turns out to be the origin, zero, zero and we want to know the value of g of zero. That means we're going to be integrating, right, because this value right here is an x value, and we're taking that x value and we're putting it into here for x, which means that it's also going into here for x. So g of zero is actually integrating from zero to zero, and as you know from the previous section, if our limits, the upper and lower limits, are the same, then the integral evaluates to zero. So g of zero is going to be zero. Then we've got g of one. And g of one tells us that we're integrating from zero to one on our function f of t with respect to t. Another way to read this is the area under the curve horizontally from 0 to 1. On the graph, that means that we're interested in finding this shaded region. And this is a nice graph because that ends up being a triangle. The base, the width is 1, the height is 2, base times height divided by 2, and that will equal 1. So g of 1 equals 1. We didn't even have to do any, any calculus, really. All we have to do is know how to find the area of a triangle. When we increase the x value to a 2, 
we're now, let me put that back actually. We're going to be including this additional region in here because we're integrating from zero to two. So G of two equals the integral from zero to two of our same function. We don't actually know what the function is, but we have this uh, graphical depiction of it. Okay, the area under the curve is that original uh, sort of orange colored area that I have there, which equaled one, plus the rectangular area, which has an area of two. So we can say that one plus those two is equal to three. And this is reminiscent of in the previous section where we took an interval, uh, we were integrating on an interval, and we actually chopped up the interval. We went from one to three to five. And we were given the area under the entire interval from one to five and the area under the interval from three to five. And we did subtraction to find out the other half, so to speak, of the area from or on the interval from one to three. So we're chopping it up into these smaller pieces, and here we're building the larger picture. In the next interval, we would have to, since there's a curve here, we would have to approximate this area, but integrating from zero to three, we add on that approximate area, and we'll have the value of that integral. And then something interesting happens, or something worth noting anyway. If we integrate then from zero to four, and we add in this new region, that region is gonna have a negative area because it's below the x-axis. So we're going to have whatever our integral was from zero to three, and then when we integrate from zero to four, we'll have to add that negative area. And then ultimately we'll be adding one more negative area once we integrate from zero to five. Let me look at the next slide. Here are some nice depictions of what we were just talking about and what we were just drawing. I drew it out by hand and I wanted to see you, uh, I wanted you to see it sort of playing out step by step because I think there's value to seeing the, the work appear on the screen one line at a time instead of having all of it just sort of dropped at you like this printed on one screen. But these are all the same things that we were just talking about. It's just typed up. It's a little neater. The diagrams over here are nicer than the ones that I was drawing. Does every textbook use this color blue? I feel like it's everywhere. Maybe it's the cheapest color to print or something. I don't know. Uh, okay, and here we are integrating up to three. So those are all positive regions. So here was the value of three that we came up with and their approximation for this region over here between two and three. That approximation is 1.3, and so they added it in and got 4.3 as the total area under the curve from 0 to 3. And then we include that next interval, which is this sort of tan color over here. There's the uh, approximate area. Notice that we're adding a negative value because it's below the x-axis. And then when we add in that final interval between 4 and 5, that's another negative area that's being estimated to be negative uh, 1.3. Um, and so we end up subtracting that away, leaving us with a total area under the curve, some positive, some negative, add it all together, final answer 1.7. And you're welcome to read this too, we've already talked about it, uh, the positive areas above the x-axis and then adding in negative values for the regions that were below the x-axis. Okay, now, I wanna talk through a portion of this with you because sometimes reading it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, if we take a function of t, like g of t, uh, or g of x, f of x, uh, so it's function notation, except here, or I could say y equals, equals t. Okay, so that's our function, t and we're gonna use a lower limit of integration. That's gonna be our a value of zero, and you can see it right there. There's the zero. Then we have g of x equaling, so g of x is kind of on the receiving end of our integration process. 
we're going to integrate from 0 to x, and we're being told here that the result of that process, integrating from 0 to x on the function t with respect to t, gives us the final answer of x squared over 2. You might be saying, <clears throat> How do they get that? And there's a t involved in there, and we've got this variable of x that's up here as the upper limit of integration. Strange. Hang in there. It's going to be okay. What the author is asking you to notice here is that if you then took the derivative of this function g, which is x squared over 2, if you took the derivative of that, and that you know how to do, and you can think of this if it's helpful as equaling one half x squared. Take the exponent, multiply it by the coefficient, the two and the one half cancel out, decrease the exponent by one, you've got x to the first power, and there it is, x to the first power. What did we just do? Didn't we just, so strange. Uh, we, we took an integral of something, we assigned it to a function, and then when we came over here and we took the derivative of that function to get this thing, an x. It's, it's strange. I get it. We did a thing and then it seems like we undid the thing. Don't forget what it is that we're talking about in this section. It's that inverse relationship between the derivative and the integral. Doing and undoing. All right? So... The point that we're trying to make here is that g prime is equal to f. So when we take the derivative of the g function, we got this answer over in the top right corner. I highlighted it in green. The derivative of g is x. What is, look to the left of that now, right here, what is f of x? Replace the t value with an x, then you'd have to replace this t value with an x all of a sudden g prime does indeed equal f, f of x instead of f of t. Okay, in other words, g is defined as the integral by f equation 1, g turns out to be antiderivative f, at least in this case, right? So this is just one example. We haven't proven this for every function under the sun. And if we sketch the derivative of the function g shown in figure 4 by estimating slopes of tangent lines, we get a graph like that of f in figure 2, so we suspect that the derivative is equal to the function. Fantastic, so that would be a fine exercise. You could do that. This exercise might be more than we really need. Let's just uh, glance at this. So we're generally considering a function f greater than zero. So we're focusing on functions that are greater than zero, that are above entirely above the x-axis then g is of x can be equal to the integral from a to x of that function. And it can be interpreted as the area under the graph of the function f from a to x, as in figure 1, which is on this slide. So we see that there's that same area from a to x. We haven't gone all the way to b yet. In order to compute g prime, From the definition of the derivative, we first observe that. So we're going all the way back to this definition of a derivative, which you may or may not want to revisit, at least not emotionally. It might have been traumatic for you. Uh, but the definition of the derivative was where we essentially had dy over dx, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, or g of x plus h minus g of x over x plus h minus x, and then we apply the limit as h went to zero. So that was that original definition of a derivative, or one of the variations on the definition of a derivative. And what happens as that x value gets really close to h, you're seeing it in figure five, is that that area under the curve gets extremely narrow. So that would be finding the derivative of g evaluated at a very specific point, or for a very specific x value. And remember, 
that g prime is equal to f. So for a small h value, we can see from the figure and uh, <clears throat> we can see this if we look back up at figure five. So we're finding the area of that really skinny rectangle. It has a width of h, it has a height of f of x. So this is the area of that rectangle. But if we take this function and we divide both sides by h, then we get what looks a whole lot like the derivative function, or rather just the process of taking the derivative, except we need to send our h value to zero. And that happens in the next line. And intuitively, we can say, the author is telling us that intuitively, it does make sense then that that's equal to g prime, which we said is equal to f. This is a very intense uh, mathematical backstory uh, or description of the relationship between the derivative and the integral. <clears throat> Importantly is that we have arrived at the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, which means there's more than one part. If f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then the function g can be defined by, or the, the function g which is defined by this statement right here, is continuous on the closed function and I always see this word as differentiable which means we can take the derivative of it. I suppose you would pronounce that differentiate uh, so it's as, a, as an ad adjective on the open interval and the first derivative of g is equal to f. Does that mean let me see if I understand this right. Does that mean that if we came, so check out this equation right here, we'll forget about the a less than x less than b. Does that mean that if I took the derivative by making this say g prime, that that sort of, it's almost like it cancels out this integral thing, but it was in terms of x, so I have to change that to an x? <clears throat> Pretty much. The derivative of an integral just takes you back to the original function, f of x, f of t, whatever. Does it always work that way? This is a very important component of that conversation. In order for it to work out that way, your lower limit of integration has to be a constant value. And the upper limit in this case is x has to be the variable that you're working with. It's gotta match up with this one. Once you've got these three pieces in place, this x and this x matching up and you've got a constant value down here this variable t doesn't matter so much it's going to get replaced by in this case an x and using the leibniz notation for derivatives so here we're taking the derivative of the integral from a to x of this function with respect to t, and the result is our original function again, in terms of x this time, instead of in terms of t. And that's the, the short of it. If we integrate and then differentiate, the result is the original function. So find the derivative, so knowing all that you know now, find the derivative of this function, g of x. So we want to take the derivative of this side of the function and the derivative of this side of the function. So g prime of x is going to equal the derivative with respect to x of the integral from zero, which is a constant value like lowercase a, up to the variable x of our function, the square root of 1 plus t squared with respect to t. And don't the derivative and the integral cancel out? Doesn't this thing and this thing, don't they just cancel each other out? And we get a final answer that's in terms of x instead of in terms of t, right? So shouldn't this equal the square root of 1 plus x squared? with a box around it, because that's our final answer. 
Yes. Is that aided by the fact that we had this key components in place where we had an X here and a constant value here? Are those necessary? Yes, but since they were there, it plays out the way that it's supposed to. And our final answer is, oh, it's written. <laughs> it was on the screen the whole time. G prime of X does equal the square root of one plus X squared. Uh, yes, that format seems strange. Thank you for stating that. Uh, this is a very specific function. I don't want to get into this. Um, if you want to look up Augustine Fresnel, I'm sure I'm, well, he's French, so I'm butchering his name. Um, check him out. There's theories about optics, I think it is. Uh, yep, famous for his work in optics. Check that out. There's the sine function. Uh, that's not where I think we want to spend a chunk of time when we're still getting used to the integration process. Let's instead move to the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2. This is something we're going to use a lot when we start working out example problems in the not-too-distant future, and I want to get to those because that's important. Part 2 says that if our function f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, that's what that says right there, that the integral from a to b is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. What the f is capital F? What is that? It's the antiderivative of lowercase f. Remember all those antiderivatives that you did where you had to have a plus C at the end? Maybe you got marked wrong for some questions because you didn't put a plus C at the end. Those are antiderivatives. F is any antiderivative of, or sorry, capital F is any antiderivative of lowercase f. Any antiderivative? I thought there was only one antiderivative. What are you talking about? You thought there was only one antiderivative. What do you think the plus C is? C could be anything. When you find an antiderivative and it's got that plus C at the end of it, that's a family of solutions. Because if C is zero, then you've got one function. And if C is a positive one, then you have to vertically shift that graph up one unit. Or if it's a negative two for a C value, you have to vertically shift that graph down two units. And so you've seen depictions of this where you have this exact graph and it's uh, copied and pasted vertically up and down, but the graph is identical. Okay, that's a family of solutions when you find the antiderivative. And what they're saying right here is that you could use any one of those. And don't worry, we'll see why. Finishing the integration inverse process. Yes, they're inverses of each other. Great, we've been talking about that ad nauseum. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, there are both components of it. What this is saying is that, or you should just note the fact that the derivative of capital F is lowercase f. Can I get that on the same screen? Mm. Yeah, uh, number two near the top of your screen is essentially identical to what I just highlighted or the, the equation that's at the bottom of the screen. What's the difference between those two? Oh, where, come on now. Uh, the difference is this and this. However, the derivative of capital F is lowercase f, so those two are the same statement. Okay, that's it. That's it for the slides. Let's go find some example problems. Uh, let me see if I can do that gracefully. That's a no, I can't do it gracefully. And that's the wrong assignment. I'm probably not logged in, right, of course.
Nope, we don't want 5.3. Yes, we do. Where are we? Five point three. Okay, so here we've got the Alright, so this is called a we didn't see this text, at least I didn't uh, say it out loud when we were looking at the uh, at the slides for the previous section. But this is called a definite integral. So we're going to be doing integration. We're going to be finding an antiderivative. Remember, please, that oh, this isn't going to work. Let's see if I can do this gracefully at all. Ooh, I think I can. That'll do. All right, that integral symbol doesn't look so good, but the rest of it's okay. No. Okay, sorry about that. Remember that the integral from a to b of lowercase f of x with respect to x is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. And I told you, and it was stated in the slides, that capital F is the antiderivative of lowercase f. So, The first thing I would like to do is determine the antiderivative of x to the third minus 6x. The antiderivative of x to the third, if we increase the exponent by 1, and then divide by the new exponent, we will get 1 fourth x to the fourth. You can take the derivative of that, and you'll get x to the third again. Nice that we can always double check our work there. Antiderivative here is 3x squared. Take the derivative, see if you get 6x again, right? So that works. Uh, I did a little bit of, a, of work in my head there. I increased the exponent by 1, so the exponents on x right here became a 2. And then I divided the 6 by the new exponent, 6 divided by 2, gave me this 3 over here. Now, as we were talking about on the previous slide, an antiderivative is supposed to have plus c at the end of it. And on the one of those last slides, it said that we can use any antiderivative of, in this case, x to the third minus 6x. I'm going to leave the plus c in there, and then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use this notation, which is fairly typical, or something closely resembling it, that says it's just a reminder of what our limits of integration are, so we're going from negative 2 to positive 3. And as I had written down but then erased uh, here once we were looking at these sample homework questions, which I'm borrowing from WebAssign, WebAssign is uh, the product of McGraw-Hill, <clears throat> great product. I'm not endorsed by them, by the way. What we're going to do now is we need to do, remember it's f of b minus f of a, so we're going to do f of 3 minus f of negative 2. And this is our function capital F. So we need to do, I'm going to put the first statement in parentheses, 1 fourth times 3 to the fourth power minus 3 times 3 to the second power plus c. We don't know what c is, and it doesn't interact with our x value of 3 at all, so it's still just a plus c, minus 1 fourth times negative 2 to the fourth power. Oops, let me put all this in parentheses also, because uh, this is f of negative 2. Minus 3 times negative 2 squared plus c. 
And from here, it's arithmetic, right? So let's see if we can do this somewhat expeditiously. I'm just writing all over the place. You're doing this on scratch paper, so you can just keep moving down one line at a time or skip a line so that it's nice and definitive and you can see your work and the exponents aren't bleeding from one line to the next. Uh, 3 to the 4th is 81, so I've got 81 fourths minus, <coughs> excuse me, 27 plus C minus Let's write this as 16 fourths. This is a positive four times three, so we're subtracting 12 plus C. And then I'm going to, I don't know what to do, plus I hate arithmetic. Let's, um, let's distribute, because I want to prove a point. Not prove a point, it's not a contest but I want to illustrate something. There you go. Let's, let me illustrate something for you. Now I'm distributing the minus sign. So this becomes minus 16 fourths plus 12 minus C. And what I'm illustrating is the fact that this plus C and this minus C are going to cancel out. So it doesn't matter which of the antiderivatives you use. In other words, it doesn't matter what the C value is. When you go to evaluate the definite integral, Whatever the C value is, it's going to cancel out because one's going to be positive and one will end up being negative. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so uh, that's the wrong color there, but that's okay. We've got 18 fourths minus 16, or 81 fourths minus 16 fourths, 81, 71, 65, 65 fourths. So those are done. And then we've got negative 27 plus 12, which is negative 15. So minus 15. Let's take the minus 15 and have it be, uh, let's make a common denominator. So we'll subtract instead of 15, let's subtract 60 fourths. 60 divided by 4 equals 15. we get 5 fourths as our answer. I'm just glancing back at my arithmetic. For those of you who don't know me, you always want to keep an eye on my arithmetic because it's not always perfect. And I'm glancing around and I'm seeing different numbers on the screen and I'm trying to keep it all together, but it's possible my eye could catch some other number and drag it into a problem and, and then all of, a, all of a sudden it becomes a bigger problem. I'm trying to zoom out here. And so our final answer for that problem is 5 fourths. All right, so we had a negative to a positive on the limit of integration. We had to do uh, or take an antiderivative in order to get this capital F. And then we evaluated capital F at 3 and at negative 2. And we subtracted those two values from each other. You could have evaluated this, gotten a number, evaluated this, gotten a number, and then done the subtraction, totally fine. I left it in pieces like this. Then I distributed the minus sign and then I sort of did some combining like terms. You can get there any number of different ways. All right, let me do some large scale erasing, hopefully. I'll try to make short work of this. And then we'll look at another couple of problems and we'll just talk about strategies on some of these problems. Uh, it'll be time consuming to work through them all. And where are we? We're at the 34 minute mark, give or take. So we've got some time. All right, we've got some room to work. What's next? Evaluate this integral. Doesn't this look to you like we're supposed to find the antiderivative of u plus five times u minus six? I don't remember, remember seeing that in any kind of a table. I know that uh, I've seen some trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent. There are the, the Piper trig functions. You've got uh, natural logs. What else was there? There was e to the x. We've seen derivatives and integrals of e to the x. 
uh, sometimes sine and cosine and tangent that you take the derivatives and you get squares and different functions in there. <clears throat> I don't remember ever seeing anything like this. They're messing with you here. All I did was FOIL and combine like terms. This is much more reasonable to try to take the derivative of. We do want to include the du because we're integrating with respect to u, and then we'll go through and find the antiderivative of this entire expression, one term at a time. That is one third u to the third minus one half u squared. You're seeing the division by the new exponent, division by the new exponent, minus 30 u. Also be careful in case you run into a problem where you're supposed to be uh, or where you have a, a variable that's in or that is one of your limits of integration. Don't just assume that you can type in an x because you're used to working with the variable x. If it says you're supposed to be using the letter u, use the letter u. And we can include the value of plus c in here or really we don't have to include the plus c when we're evaluating a definite integral because we know that that c is going to cancel out. So let's just put a reminder of our limits of integration from one to zero, or rather zero to one. And then we can go through and find f of one minus f of zero. Let me erase these arrows so that they don't distract us later. There we go, and f of one. So that is one third times one to the third minus one half times one to the second power minus 30 times one. I'm gonna put all of that in parentheses. That's my f of one minus one third zero to the third minus one half zero squared minus 30 times zero. It depends on your circumstances. If you're supposed to be showing all of your work or if this is a free response question, you wanna present all of this very nicely and demonstrate to your teacher or your instructor or a professor that you know what it is that you're doing and that you're supposed to be doing substitution. The number one is not very eventful, right? You just, I know what I'm doing. One third times one to the third power, really? You took the time to write that out? Yeah, because I'm trying to demonstrate to you what your mind should be doing while you're solving these problems. Once you get good at these, this is a joke. I would have evaluated this whole thing in my head, but I'm, I'm trying to show you what your mind should be doing and trying to develop an organized technique. Now we'll start doing some of that stuff in our head. This is one third. This is minus a half. This is minus 30. That's gonna be quite the common denominator there. This entire thing turns out to be a zero. So maybe we just want to put minus zero, just to show that uh, we didn't forget about it, okay? From there, you've got arithmetic. Um, this is two over six, this is three over six, this is not, this is not an equal sign. Minus 180 over six, I suppose we could do it that way. 2 minus 3 is negative 1, minus another 180 is negative 181 over 6. That does not simplify by 2 or by 3, so we're stuck with that. That's your exact answer. You don't want to put that as a decimal. I think it's going to have a bunch of 6s at the end of it. Uh, although you could write it as mm, negative 30.16 repeating, I'm pretty sure, is what it would be in a calculator. Uh, but that's your exact answer. Okay, <clears throat> what's the most important part about this uh, particular problem? What do you want to take special note of? Uh, we did not include the plus C over here. Okay, we talked about that in the last problem. It's not really necessary for a definite integral. We, oh, a, a big sort of special part, big special, I'm so articulate today. Um, foiling and combining like terms first in order to, to turn that product of binomials into a very basic 
uh, trinomial where our integration after that was very easy. So that very first step of foiling and combining like terms was extremely helpful. We're still getting used to, to this and utilizing this kind of notation. Uh, use whatever notation your teacher or professor likes. I highly, highly, highly recommend using parentheses around these two quantities, making your minus sign that's in here very evident because when there's a lot of uh, arithmetic going on inside those two sets of parentheses, you don't want to forget to change signs in the second set of parentheses. Otherwise, just do your arithmetic as two different groups of arithmetic and then do the, the subtraction. What else, what else, what else? I think that was it. Okay, so those are some of the, the big points of interest in that one. I don't think I need to erase more than that. Let's just talk about the rest of these, I think, will be sufficient. The first thing I would recommend doing in problem three is what I call the distributive property of division. Division and multiplication have the same priority level. Uh, they abide by the same rules, except that you can multiply by zero, but you don't want to divide by zero. Maybe other than that, they're the same rules. But you must distribute your division, so the first thing I recommend doing in this one is writing this as, what's with me in the equal signs? I'm just throwing them around. I would divide each of the terms in the numerator by the square root of x that's in the denominator. You probably then want to do this division, x divided by the square root of x. You can also think of this as x to the first power being divided by x to the one half power. That way you can do the upper exponent minus the lower exponent, one minus one half equals one half. So you could write this as x to the one half power minus, there's an invisible x to the zero up here and an x to the one half down here. So you could do zero minus one half and get x to the negative one half power, except it's gotta have a coefficient of five on it. We still need that five. And then this negative one half, remember that the negative in the exponent position pushes that factor down into the denominator, making it a one half or x to the one half downstairs, as I like to say. And that is still with respect to x. x to the one half, increase the exponent, and then divide by the new exponent. In the second term, increase the exponent of negative one half, so you're increasing it by one, add one to it, and then divide by that new exponent. What about dividing by an exponent when my exponent is a fraction? Am I allowed to divide by a fraction? Sure, if you've got x to the three halves and you have to divide by three halves, remember that division by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So this could be written as two thirds x to the three halves. And look what would happen if you multiplied this exponent times this coefficient. It would turn into a one. And look over here, what is the coefficient right here? It's a one. So it works. You can always do your uh, integration or take your antiderivative and check your work. Make sure that you did it correctly by taking the derivative and seeing if it takes you back where you came from. They're inverse relationships. Isn't that convenient? Right, so this is the work that's involved in finding the antiderivative of that first term. I'm going to leave you to find the antiderivative of the second term. And then I want to chat about number four for a second. Uh, we need the antiderivative of secant squared. I can never remember. Is it the, is the derivative of tangent secant squared? Or is the derivative of secant secant squared? No, that can't be. 
tangent must be secant squared and secant is secant tan. Oop, not x, it's a t. So once you take the antiderivative, oh, I shouldn't have the limit of integration in front of there still. We've taken the antiderivative already. Now what we want to do is write a note that we're going to be evaluating this antiderivative from zero to pi over four. So you'll plug in the pi over four, you'll plug in the zero, you'll do the subtraction. <clears throat> Mm, tangent of pi over 4 is 1 times 8 is 8. Tangent of 0, 0 times 8 is 0. Pretty sure you're looking at an answer of 8 for this one. Interesting. Okay. Um, notice also that this 8 as a, as a constant multiple could have been factored out of the integration process at the very beginning. We could have gotten rid of the eight and put it out front of here. And then you could think of it as evaluating this integral, getting an answer, evaluating the integral, there it is, there's the evaluation process, getting an answer, and then multiplying your answer by eight. Okay, that multiple of eight is gonna exist in both of those terms anyway, this is gonna end up being eight times f of pi over four minus f of zero. And then you multiply the eight in, or you could have the eight in here and the eight in here, that's okay. Either way, it's gonna work out. I'll leave you to, well, we already talked about the arithmetic on that one. You're going to have to figure out what is the antiderivative of secant tan. I'm going to leave that one up to you. Or is that just mean? Is there a derivative of something that's secant tan? You want to think on that one for a second? Is it possible, I, I, <clears throat> you should look it up and figure it out for yourself. Uh, the derivative of something is equal to secant tan. The other possibility is something that could happen very similar to problem number three in this homework set, similar to problem number two, where we had to do a little bit of initial work before we actually went and took the antiderivative. You could be given an expression in here that's uh, utilizing trig functions where you have to simplify it first. So just be aware, you know, you could, secant is reciprocal cosine, tangent is sine over cosine, if I could write. Oh, okay, sine over cosine squared, that's not helpful. But if this had, if this secant had just been a cosine, in which case this just said cosine, then the cosines would cancel, and then the only thing you're integrating is the sine function. But in this case, you definitely want to figure out what the antiderivative of secant tan is. Uh, number six, same thing, you want to distribute your division first here. So this is equal to the integral from three to four of four over u to the third, turn that into a negative exponent, plus u squared over u to the third, the whole thing is with respect to u, so put a du at the end of there. And uh, you'll want to simplify this fraction first, probably turn that into a negative exponent also. Then do your antiderivative, and then evaluate capital F of 4 minus capital F of 3. There are more scenarios that you're going to run into with these definite integrals. There are more strange uh, maneuvers that you're going to have to do in here in preparation to take the antiderivative. There are stranger 
expressions that are going to appear in here that are going to have uh, cause you to need to refer to a table in order to figure out what the antiderivative is. All right, so these are just introductory level ones. I hope those are helpful. Take care.